Well, hello, glue troopers, and welcome to Tarbis 2, i.e. my living room, or as we lovingly call it, the pilot room. Well, I finished the Glencoe Vanguard today, which, as you know, is a repop of the original Adams Vanguard kit. And I made mine as TV3, uh, which is the one that famously blew up on the pad, the nose cone falling off. And I'm very happy with the way it looks. There are plenty of blemishes on it. When I initially did all the subcomponents and pre-painted everything, it actually looked pretty good. Most of the issues came about when I put everything together and would wind up somehow, whether through dripping glue or a thumbprint uh, or something like that, the handling of the missile while I was putting it together is where most of the blemishes came in. But it's up on the shelf. It looks good. I'm very, very happy with it. I definitely recommend the kit, especially if you're all into model rockets. I, I hope that uh, Nick over at Glencoe is still making them because it wouldn't break my heart to get another one. My wife liked it so much, she had me put it up on top of the shelf here in the living room on primary display. It actually replaced my other Glencoe kit, which was uh, a remake, I believe, of an old I ITC kit, ITC kit, which is the Explorer 1. And since I happen to have the Explorer 1 and the Vanguard and everything right here, while my wife and I were having coffee, I kind of told her the story. And she said, that would be a great subject. You've got to tell everybody this story in my somewhat animated fashion. So here goes. Uh, I believe it was 56, 57, uh, geofiscal year. The Russians announced that they plan to put a satellite up and the Americans announced the same thing. Eisenhower has three basic options. He can either use Von Braun's trusty dusty V2 or some derivative thereof, such as the Jupiter C or the Juno. And then there's also the option of using the Atlas, which is basically a big aluminum balloon that uh, could get something pretty substantial into orbit. There's also the United States Navy's skinny little Vanguard, which is still being developed. Well, Eisenhower, it didn't take him long to figure out there's no way that the Atlas is going to be ready in time. It, it clearly had a lot of development ahead of it before it was going to be ready to carry anything into space, and he was right on that one. The Juno Jupiter C seemed like the easiest option. It was, a, it was called Old Reliable. It was a very trusty uh, system. Bad. There's no question that Von Braun knew what he was doing. But there was still that dark cloud of Von Braun's association with World War II, the German V-2 program, the missile's direct relationship to the V-2, and this was not the image that the American space program wanted. They want an all-American missile designed by all-American boys, and of course the U.S. Navy's Vanguard fit that bill. But the Vanguard was a long way from being ready, so they tried to rush through as fast as they could. As most of you probably know, it was an extremely unreliable system. It was, uh, I believe, largely based on the old Viking system, which had actually worked fairly well, but they were doing a lot with it, making a lot of changes, asking a lot out of a lot of guidance problems. This is all new. You gotta remember, this is when cars still had tail fins and seat belts were a $3 option on a new car. So the Vanguard, the Navy, you know, being military service, they got their marching orders, yes sir, will do, and, and, and marched off and did their very best. And to their credit, they were eventually successful. The problem was time. Well, uh, the first couple of Vanguards actually, when they just did like the first stage test, the first second stage test, the first couple of them worked and then they started having guidance problems as they were getting up there and went out of control, a lot of other stuff. And they said, okay, we're gonna try and pop this little grapefruit sized uh, satellite up there, which by the way, was despite being smaller, was much more sophisticated than the Russian Sputnik. It actually had solar panels on it, could recharge. That's the one that blows up on the pad. Uh, I believe it was due to low fuel pressure. And then uh, it comes back down, goes, you know, the nose cone falls off and, you know, all of a sudden you've got Kaflopnik. And uh, they just, the, the news media had uh, a, a grand day with this. And the, <laughs> I mean, come on, you can't blame them. That was just low hanging fruit. The, I mean, the, with the whole nose cone falling off and everything, it was just too easy. But that aside, the Navy is trying as hard as they could, doing the best they could, just they knew they weren't going to make the deadline. Eisenhower was getting a little desperate, Sputnik had flown, and they finally, the Eisenhower administration reluctantly gave Von Braun the, the go-ahead to put up Explorer 1. Now, there's a story behind that that dovetails into this perfectly. And it, makes, it helps you understand how Von Braun managed to survive under the mercurial Nazi regime. 
I mean, he had, there were times when he had conflicting orders on his desk from the SS and, 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 and the Wehrmacht that were both threatening with death. One, if he did something, one, if he didn't do something, I mean, he was pretty much going to get lined up against the wall either way. And he managed to, he and his men managed to negotiate that uh, Game of Thrones, Chamber of Horrors regime uh, and survive to come to the U.S. So, but, and you do that by being very clever. And what Von Braun did was, is a bunch of the... Uh, Chrysler was making the Redstones and the Jupiters, and they were coming down the assembly line. And Von Braun was pushing everyone to let him launch a satellite. And they were like, no, Werner, you cannot have a missile to launch your satellite. You know, that the Navy's taking care of that with Vanguard. You build our missiles. And Von Braun, you know, he kind of gathered the boys around, you know, the old Berlin boys. And actually, I think they were mostly from Munich, but it doesn't matter. So he says, gentlemen, there is no way the Navy is going to have that thing ready to go in time. They will come back to us, but we must be ready. So, Dieter, Hans, Wilhelm, we can't have one of these missiles on the production line for our satellite, but we do need to do a long-term storage test. Yeah, see how these things do when they just sit around doing nothing. So pick one, put it over there, put the top over it, Forget it's there. And if any inspectors come by and go, what is los? You tell them it is a test being done for the long term storage because these missiles will be in long term storage. Yeah, it's good. And actually, I don't think Von Braun's accent was anything like that, but you get the point. So, when all these things, when Vanguard failed to get the job done and the Eisenhower administration had to give Von Braun a shot, they were, he says, Mr. President, I can have one up in 30 days. And they were like, there's no way you're going to get one in 30 days. You don't have a missile. That's not entirely accurate. Since he had a rocket put aside, he made the, the necessary tinkerings to it. Uh, Van Allen and Pickering had been working with him on the working satellite, which, by the way, the satellite is the four-stage. It does have that engine in the rear. That's the four-stage motor. This is Explorer 1. And you can see that the missile sticks out of the top. Now that can that it's on, and you watch the old footage, you see it rotating. So it's got that black stripe, so you can see that it's rotating. That had a series of blue with sergeant missiles in it, and they rotated it so that if one or two of the missiles cut out, the rotation would balance everything out. And uh, so you had uh, this stage, you know, the big main burn stage. Then I believe there were 12 in the ring, then inside the center of the can, there are, I believe, three more in a cluster that made up the third stage. It actually popped out of the middle of this donut. And then you had on the uh, missile, on um, the satellite itself, you had that last one. And it got into orbit and it did its job. Eventually, Vanguard would get some successful launches. But like I say, they only had three successful launches out of 11 attempts. But when it worked, it really worked. Two of those satellites are still up there. Mm -hmm. Not bad for the skinny little rocket that could. So that's kind of the story of Vanguard. Of course, Vanguard got surpassed by emerging technology. It's easy to pick on it as a substandard system that didn't work well, but everything about it was new. I mean, as, in test flight and especially in rockets, you've got to allow for failure. Von Braun was successful because he already had an essentially working platform. It was only politics that uh, kept us from beating the Russians pretty much into, into space and, and uh, into manned space. Uh, those were decisions that were made by the technical staff or by politicians that got in the way. Uh, von Braun was actually ready to send Shepard up before Gagarin, but they'd had one minor problem on one of the tests. That was when the monkey went too high because they, a, 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 they had a hot burn and one of the switches didn't work properly. And they were like, look, we know what it is. We know what this, Shepard was talking about this. We know what the switch is. Let's just go ahead and fix it. I'm ready to go. But Von Braun wanted a perfect test flight before he sent a man up. And in the interim, Gagarin went up and thus the space, space race. But had the Americans gone up first and been able to grab the brass ring first in space, whether it be a satellite and or a man, it's distinctly possible we wouldn't have had the space race, we wouldn't have had the development that we had. And so, you know, you, you, you can play around with history all you want, but that's essentially the short version of, uh, you know, how things got kicked off. 
Vanguard to me is a beautiful rocket. They finally got it to work. It, it was an extremely primitive technology by today's standards, but it was what they had at the time. They were doing the best they had with the gun, and then they did get it to work. People tend to forget, they, all they see is it exploding on national TV, and they forget that, hey, <laughs> that was only the third or fourth launch of one of these things using basically wristwatch and slide rule technology. So come on guys, let's cut on some slag. And they did eventually get to work, and those motors, I believe are still in uh, operation today. I upgraded more modernized versions of them, but or at least were for a long time, and I think some of them still are. So, you know, it's a pretty missile. It did eventually work, and despite its bad reputation, and I'm as guilty of anyone that's poking fun at it, but you know what? You know, give a rocket its due. Props to it. Two of its satellites are still up there. That's got to be some kind of duration record. So, that's what I wanted to talk about tonight. In other news, uh, I did uh, get the Terra Cruiser on the table, so I'm going to be starting on that when I come back from my trip. I don't know if I'll be getting any content out on this trip or not. My hope is is that I'll get over to the Crawford Museum and maybe Ralphie's house. Uh, got a couple of phone calls with some uh, former kit model executives I want to uh, arrange a Zoom session with uh, for later on. And uh, I also got working on Viewers Build 21 today. Uh, you guys have sent me so many pictures. You know, I don't really do these things on any kind of a schedule. It's just when I figure I have enough images and uh, gonna do something a little different with the music this time. Uh, a little more sh straightforward, but no big deal. Uh, you guys are putting in some some cool stuff and, I'm, and uh, I've got the B25 build mostly arranged. I'm just waiting to see if more pictures come in. I get back on the 26th, so I will try to have it compiled and uploaded by the 27th, uh, Doolittle's birthday. So that's where we're at with all that. Guys, I hope you're having a wonderful evening. And guys, as always, model on. Yeah, I don't think I can pick on Bezos.